Good morning, everyone. Let's begin with, uh, I think we're going, we finished off with a, the landing of uh, Odysseus on the island of Ithaca and with the revelation of Athena to Odysseus. Remember, we uh, read that touching episode in which she called him a scoundrel and a thief and a liar, uh, and thereby he was just like her, uh, two of a kind. Uh, she had tested him as well, and that is interesting. She told him that he would have to trust no one and uh, make sure to disguise his, his identity. He, had, he should have learned that from the episode with Poseidon on the land of the Cyclops. Uh, but uh, she's testing him to see if he has learned. And, and testing is also a mark of wisdom. Not, you don't trust things on the basis of their appearances, you have to investigate. And investigation takes place through, largely through dialectic, what, what Socrates will call dialectic. So there's a, a uh, yes, there's a process of deceit, but then it's, it's questioning discernment what, what the, where the other person stands in relation to you. Uh, and Athena covered Ithaca with, with a fog so that he didn't even know that he was on Ithaca, disguised herself as a shepherd boy, and Odysseus passed the test with flying colors because he told the shepherd boy a false story about who he was and how he got there. <coughs> and at that, uh, you know, he learned from his, his mother, the queen in the underworld, um, that uh, he should do certain things and he, he tricks her. And at that point, the, she then reveals herself as a beautiful woman, which is also a disguise to some degree because the, who knows how the goddess actually appears. But she now appears to him and says, okay, you've passed the test, make sure you do this. So she re reiterates the lesson. And this repetition of a lesson is one that Homer has used throughout the Odyssey. Right from the outset, if you recall, I said that there was a um, a model of behavior being made by negative and positive examples. So the example of Agamemnon returning home to a hostile Aegisthus who slew him and his wife Clytemnestra, he appeared uh, unguarded. He came home expecting a welcome, which is not, uh, quite frankly, I wouldn't have thought is a unusual thing to expect, but instead he was murdered for it. And that has always been a threat to Odysseus as well. And the lesson to the Greek culture is that they do not trust things on the basis of mere appearances. They always need to investigate, to scrutinize, to question people's words because people lie. The truth is something that is hard to discern. This is again a, a Greek way of looking at the world. It, it gives rise, even though Plato and, the, and Socrates in particular uh, is, has trouble with the Greek poets and their representation of reality. It does, even in Homer, suggest that the Greeks are well aware that they cannot simply take things at face value. And they never do. And they, they, dis, they dig deeper. They question things. They want to get behind to the nature of reality. So the Homer's worldview is already the foundation, I think, for the philosophers. As much as the philosophers dispute with him, they also rely on him. It, that, that method that Odysseus uses of, of using craft and cunning to discern and get at the true nature of things, where people really are, is that which the philosophers make their whole method and turn it against Homer, as it were, in the end. But she reveals herself as the personification of wisdom. And she says that uh, Odysseus is just like her. He uses techne, craft, uh, skills, wit, storytelling, these sorts of things in order to uh, look at things more closely. And all of these things will be characteristic of Greek science and philosophy. They will use techne, but chiefly they will use their wits and they will use storytelling in order to say something more profound about reality. It's not just telling stories. I, I, I need to emphasize that. Uh, one of the ways in which this uh, Homer's Odyssey is seen is as uh, a way of telling stories. It's all about storytelling. That's, I think, a superficial way of seeing 
this uh, epic. It's not only about storytelling, it's about storytelling to get to the nature of reality. And that's an important thing. And, and, and until you get to the nature of reality, you never really get home. You don't get where you want to be. And Odysseus exemplifies that. We'll come to Plato's critique of Homer and the poets uh, briefly. By the way, this uh, <coughs> painting I have on behind me is of, of Odysseus coming home to the suitors and taking care of them, looking very much uh, not like a Greek, but looking more like uh, somebody of the era in which it was uh, written, probably more of a Roman toga here and so forth. But anyway, but this is Athena. As you can see, it's a woman at the center fighting alongside Odysseus. Um, so she, he, rep, he is almost the, the human personification of wisdom, and she, of course, is the goddess that represents wisdom. And uh, she is, uh, once again, Athena is the goddess most strongly associated with Athens, represented by the owl. Right? So it, w Athens is renowned for wisdom all the way down from this day to the point where when Paul is disputing uh, in Acts 17 with the philosophers who spend nothing, they do all day, they dispute and talk about new ideas. So that legacy perdures and he speaks with who? The Stoics and the Epicureans, their successors to Plato's Academy. So the, the, the philosophical tradition uh, and of disputing and discussing and arguing and debating and getting to the nature of things. That is so strongly associated with Athens, so it leaves its mark. So um, there's a preparation for the suitors. The suitors are, uh, as I say, parallel in some ways to this figure of, of Aegisthus who slew Agamemnon. And Odysseus cannot come home unprepared. He can't be naive about what he might encounter. And the goddesses of, of wisdom is preparing him to meet them. And that preparation means you have to be willing to dissemble, to deceive, and to, be, and to suffer many blows. And this is part of, of, of manhood. We saw another side of it if you looked at Homer's Iliad. <coughs> Homer's Iliad, as I said, there, there's this, this great uh, Kleos, uh, fame and, uh, oh gosh, I, the Greek word has just escaped me and I don't know why. It's just one of the things that happens to me early in the morning. Uh, Kleos and, what did I say? You got in your notes there? Nostos. Nostos, correct. Oh my goodness. Thank you. The Nostos is the homecoming, the Kleos is the fame. If Achilles returns home, he will not be famous. He chooses to be famous rather than to return home. For Odysseus, unless he returns home, he will not succeed in being the man he is famed to be. It's fated to be even. So the two are presented as, in some ways, antitheses. They, they are foils for one another. Both of them represent a Greek ideal of manhood. One is more the martial valor on the battlefield. That sort of physical strength, which is a part of, of the Greek notion of what a man is. Yes, and, and in Athens and in all the polises of the Greek uh, uh, of Peloponnesia, they all were ready to fight all the way up to 60. You had to be in physical condition because you could at any time be called out to battle. And there is no standing army. The, the citizens themselves will be the army. You don't call others to do it. You yourself will be a part of that. So you have to be fit and ready to go. And um, so that is something even for a philosopher. Philosophers also fought. Plato himself would have fought in battle. And so that's the Achillean side, if you will. But the other side is the side where Odysseus reigns. And that is more in the city itself where we need to discern the truth. We sometimes need to deal with, with language and words and sometimes with deceit or uh, using rhetoric, persuasion. 
Uh, that is illustrated most strongly by Odysseus. So there are two sides being portrayed. The two together, the composite of the two, represents uh, a full portrait of the ideal for, for Homer and for the Greeks. And, and I think I said that, yeah, I did say, that uh, these two books were seen as more or less something like a Bible for the Greeks.